We're going to review on 2017 very very shortly because we want to concentrate on the topics of today. Tomorrow we don't know, we learn this tonight. <laughs> um, and, and Lance, first of all, asked for the biggest flop in 2017. And Lance, you said, stock market volatility, it's been the most calm market since 1964. And your statement, I asked for a provocative statement, <laughs> the current bull market circle will not die of old age. They never do. And it won't die from rising interest rates raising interest rates, falling earnings, or due political event. It will die of complacency and boredom. So what was the boring year 2017? <laughs> boring year, yeah, I can start with a fun topic. Yeah, 2017, as you all probably recall, back in 16, we had a pretty contentious election uh, that ended in sort of a surprise, and uh, the Britons decided they would no longer want to be part of the European Union. So. 2016 had a lot of very, very um, sort of earth-shaking events, I would say, and so as the, the, the pundits out there were projecting that 2017 would be full of uh, tax reform, uh, health care disruption, uh, we're going to see some infrastructure spending from the new administration, and not too many of the things that really occurred, but one thing was sure is that this was going to be a really up and down year, and it turns out it's been quite the opposite. It's been a very calm market. Uh, the stock market has been up every single month for the first 11 months of the year, which hasn't happened in a long time. And volatility, uh, the measure of volatility, how much stock prices go up and down, it's the lowest since the early 60s. So I believe personally that uh, this bull market, which we're about eight, going on nine years, which is the market's up 250% or so from the very bottom of the stock market in 2009. I believe that going forward, the returns will be a little bit less in stocks, and I think that might lead to a little bit of boredom on the part of investors, maybe looking for something more exciting, maybe something in the, in the cryptocurrency uh, range. And so I tend to think that, uh, yeah, <laughs> so I tend to think uh, the old saying is that stock market uh, never dies of old age, and I believe it won't be the case here. I think that we'll see people start to look elsewhere for high returns. And I think that usually uh, chasing what happened in the past, as I said before, is not a good idea. So this year the market in the U.S. is up, oh, t what, 20, mid 20 percent or maybe low 20s. Um, the European and Japanese markets up in the low 20s. Emerging markets, those uh, what, what's called the BRIC countries, uh, Brazil's, Russia's, India, China, up over 30 percent. So it's just been a very, very strong year and not a lot of pullbacks for uh, investors on the sidelines who are waiting for lower prices to enter in. So um, I'm looking, well, we'll get to the 18 uh, projections we'll to them, soon, yeah. but it's been a very, very boring year, which for myself and a lot of my clients has been a good thing. We've celebrated this nice year. Okay, kind of, kind of jumping on that, you said your specialty is counter-cyclical investment. How can I counter-cyclical invest in a boring environment? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're totally right. If you. Uh, uh, get out of the market maybe seven years ago, you're almost dead uh, if you have uh, clients' money under management. But um, uh, in the meantime, between uh, counter cyclical uh, action, it is the trend is your friend, of course. Uh, I will give you an example. Um, can I imagine your unknown uncle uh, will donate 10 million US dollars to you next day? What, what, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you have a good advisor with a lot of uh, a bunch of investment ideas. What would you do? Would you invest it uh, all the ten million dollars next day or the next week? I uh, guess not. Yeah, but imagine you are fully invested right now because you invested your money in the past. Uh, but isn't it the same? You have to think every day again if you invest the money or not. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. I should. Yeah. So, uh, uh, hands up, who does? Yeah. Every day, hands up, please yeah. not. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you can't do this day by day, but you, you should ask yourself that uh, uh, every six months, maybe, or uh, once a year. And um, so uh, I think it's, it's not possible to time the market. Uh, Warren Buffett said, when, whenever you name a price, never name a date. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I know a lot of uh, crash guru. Do you know uh, how a crash guru is built? A uh, crash guru is a guy who uh, writes a book, The Crash is Coming. And um, many guys are doing that, but nobody reads the book because the crash won't happen. <laughs> uh, but some guys are lucky. 
uh, they had uh, the book at the right time, and the next year they had a crash course right. and television, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and you will find it in the newspaper on the first page. So uh, my advice is because uh, to time the market is, is my experience is not possible, but uh, a very important thing is the sentiment. Yeah? After the bull market of eight years, uh, it's better to be a little bit more careful. <coughs> And to do it stepwise would be the right answer. So coming back to the 10 million from your unknown uncle, uh, it could be a good idea uh, to uh, invest in pro rata. And it's your decision uh, to, to do it over three years or two years uh, minimum uh, to split it over the year. And uh, that was all the time the answer to my clients when they asked me, um, is it the right time to invest? <laughs> or to get out, I said, I can't answer this question, do it stepwise. Um, that's an easy, everybody can do that, like a saving plan. Um, um. Thank you, thank you for the advice, I'm waiting for the uncle. <laughs> <laughs> Tosten, coming to you, I read your profile linked and it says, the, your first skill is crazy. Correct. And you're endorsed by four people, by the way. Only four. So Only I'll four. Guys. <laughs> uh, what was the craziest thing you invested in in 2017? Oh my God. And I think one I can't talk about, unfortunately. I think the one I can't talk about is quantum computing. Um, I think it's pretty crazy because there's so many big companies going after <clears> it. Um, quantum computing um, is basically instead of having the traditional transistors where you do compute, you use quants, and quants can have like several states at once, it's very esoteric, there's a lot of math behind it. And the crazy thing about that is, it's just that, you know, you can do very, very huge calculations in a fraction of a time, because now you can have like several states calculated at once, versus going through it step by step. So instead of doing like 20 calculations after each other, you do them all at the same time with one single quant. So that's like, in a nutshell, it's probably wrong, people are gonna, gonna crucify me now. Um, but the reason that this is pretty crazy is that a lot of large companies are investing tons of money. So Facebook and Google and IBM um, pouring like millions and millions and millions behind that. And as a venture capitalist, we have to have a portfolio approach. We can't just, you know, have the, the 500 million dollars just all in one basket and then, you know, fingers crossed it's gonna work out. And so for us, it's really about like, which company do we select that we believe has the best leadership team that can execute on a smaller amount? Because we can't compete with the corporate R&D budgets of very large <coughs> enterprises. You know, we, we fund startups. And uh, making that decision is pretty crazy because you know, in the end, it's like something that, I'm not a PhD, I don't understand the technology. We have to believe in the team, and we have to evaluate people. And we have to evaluate like, how, how viable is it that these people will be able to create an organization and a governance body that can move that forward. And so you have to have a lot of faith. It's not a municipality bond. That's why it's called venture capital and not a <laughs> bond. And uh, that was pretty crazy. Philip, Sarah, besides crypto, is there any crazy things you do? <laughs> uh, personally or professionally? <laughs> Whatever you like. Uh, no, I think uh, for me personally and professionally, crypto is probably the craziest thing that I've uh, put my toe in the water. Um, but something that I'm pretty excited about to see what happens in 2018 in particular. We we'll come to that later. Mm -hmm. yeah. Crazy things. I mean, being an entrepreneur, you have to be a nut job. So, <laughs> I mean, you, you have to want to uh, to fight all the odds. You have to want to stay up at night. You want to put your family at risk. That's that's what comes with being an entrepreneur. So, I would say, you know, if you if you really like want to be capturing that gold of the future, you know, proceeds, you have to accept the risk that goes alongside with it. So, it's a lifestyle. Good word. Good word. Um, coming from 2017, I thought about a couple of things that came to my mind, and I'm not a financial expert actually, but what are the hot topics we see in the market right now? And we want to talk about four or five of them if we have the time to do today. Of course, one is the, the crypto stuff, but we definitely put it in the end because you all have to stay. <laughs> um, we want to start with IoT, because IoT around is also, I think, a very hot topic for everybody of us. And I read Gartner's 10 prediction for IT organizations. It says by 2020, IoT technology will be in 95% of electronics for new product designs, which I think is important 
Forbes says the 10 predictions, and that's something, a specific product, enterprises will ramp up their efforts to pilot and roll out voice-based services to customers. The complexity, breadth, and, uh, and quality of voice-based services from the Fortune 500 will grow in 2018 in, with available service likely doubling. Boston, you are, from your background, of course, with voice-based and all of this, the right person to answer the question on the first. Is voice-based the topic of 2018 for us? So I think that in the last year, when you look in 2017, so far we have deployed about $820 million in startups that are voice-based services, all about digital um, transformation of call centers to um, automatic voice recognition. Um, the year before, it was $212 million, so suddenly you know, can see almost 4x more capital in one year deployed, although these people want to return. Um, and we see that trend continuing. And um, I think artificial intelligence and voice recognition is really driving that. Um, everyone in Germany knows how expensive people are and how expensive um, first level support is. Now we can push that to digital channels and trying to have everything done over Twitter or chat interfaces or chatbots. But the fact is that the millennial generation want voice interfaces. And you know, we also always have to remind them. Serious listening. <laughs> Good that no one has an Amazon Echo here, otherwise I'll order myself some books, maybe. <laughs> and um, you can see this as a good example. Um, and we always have to remind ourselves that we, in our age, are not really the end users anymore. There's a whole new generation coming, and we have to understand them really well. And we see that um, my kids are 8 and 11, and now they use voice search. They don't type anymore. And now they do have a keyboard, they could use that, but it's just so much easier. In customer care, you see so many new innovations coming up where um, you have context around the voice. And um, just the amount of money that gets poured into all the ecosystem around voice is, is really amazing. And I think this is what we have to think about in 2018, about um, innovations around voice, is how whole ecosystem is developing around that as well. It's not just Twilio where you have a you know, text-speech interface, speech-text interface. It's a whole ecosystem of innovation and intelligence around that that makes it a very compelling offering in the future, I think. So is that disrupting the entire industry? Anybody else comment on that? Or other IoT stuff? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm coming at it from a security perspective. So basically, if you, if, I mean, I'm exposed to a lot of security flaws at this point in time. And if you think of you know, Adobe bringing out you know, voice simulation <coughs> is actually trained with AI within minutes. Um, there is no more security in that. So actually, sort of when you look at uh, the digital finger fingerprint of your voice, it's absolutely copyable. Uh, we're going to find some very interesting um, use cases around that that will hit us all in this room because uh, voice interfaces allow a lot of identification, but also usability and so forth. And we we have no security whatsoever that actually the voice on the other end is really my wife's voice in that case, or you know my boss's voice, or anyone else. So it's going to be very interesting to see those interfaces that actually don't have a lot of additional verification around them. <coughs> Two-factor authentication is really hard to do in that context mm -hmm. That's right. um, to, to actually be successful. So sure, sure. I understand that the security point. Should we also think about like everybody, somebody is listening all the time to us? Isn't that an issue we should talk about? It's a reality. Yeah, that's a reality. So you know, when you think about Facebook Messenger and Instagram that's listening to your voice when you have enabled it, um, I think that the danger here is really that making any sort of legislation around that to prevent it almost becomes impossible now that it's an accepted fact. So you get asked this one time, do you want to enable your microphone so that you know you can on Instagram like post your videos and stuff? Of course you say yes, but you don't know that it's on the whole time, it never says that about it, right? And so if that becomes a, a common fact for us, we really have to think about this um, from a citizen perspective. Because you know, once it's too late, no one can go back and say, "Oh, we're going to turn this off again." You know, it's going to be very, very, very hard, especially for the next generation. And so it's it's very dangerous, I find. And when it, when there is so much money involved, right. also the yeah. economy, you know, you, you don't want to turn that that money stream off so easily. <laughs> and not just the voice; it's also uh, uh, I know two startups and for the film industry, they are possibly. Uh, to simulate the mimic while you are speaking. Uh, and that is really dangerous. Imagine uh, Trump uh, is saying in Senate 
the bomb back to North Korea, uh, everybody uh, will think it's, it's true, but it could be a simulation of that. That's why I mentioned There was one interesting thing you said, you said uh, the other day in the, in the request uh, uh, coming to AI, which is closely connected to IoT. Your specialization, you, you see the best use case for AI in health. Yeah. And you were talking about the Ada Health, uh, uh, the Berlin yeah. unicorn, next generation unicorn that you helped with. Um, I, I saw on Forbes, and now it's not only 10 for IoT, uh, uh, 10, 10, it's 51 artificial intelligence predictions for uh, 2018, so we are raising the bar here. It's somewhat safe to predict that AI will continue to be at the top of the hype circle in 2018. We expect to see continued investment in AI by VCs from the technology and non-technology sectors. We get a lot of investors here. How do you feel about it? And first of all, why is it help in the first place? Um, because it's the biggest company in my portfolio. I like to show you that um, the ADA app, yeah, you can download it on an Android or an iPhone. Uh, it's called ADA Health, and the app called ADA, ADA.com. And uh, ADA is a, is a Berlin based uh, startup, and um, they needed uh, seven years to develop it. And, uh, uh, many uh, family members from the Henkel family uh, finance it privately. And uh, it's a startup a start before they made the series A round with nearly 100 employees. Mm -hmm. And so it was difficult to finance it, as you can imagine, maybe. And it is a doctor in your pocket. It's an AI bot, and you can go in a dialogue with it. Uh, and um, a normal GP now is between uh, 50 and 55 diseases. But the most uncommon diseases are around about 90. So that means if you go to a GP, uh, there is a, a chance of 30% that they that he don't know what, what your problem is. And um, Ada was developed to uh, help to find uh, rare diseases. It was developed as a uh, doctor decision support system. Mm -hmm. uh, not the, the idea from F was later on because they asked themselves what to do with it with the technology. <laughs> And um, so, uh, and it's enormous, enormous what you can say from Costco. You may know uh, a an, an startup, a an, an health insurance company here in the US called Oscar. And um, they, uh, if you're a client of this insurance, you have to have a telephone call before you visit a doctor. And uh, you can't imagine uh, 30 percent, 30 up to 35 uh, percent is done after this call. Uh, so that means it saved uh, the, the health insurer 35% uh, only uh, by the patient has to call a doctor. With this app, you can uh, do a lot of things uh, remotely in the future. And uh, so imagine you can save 50% of cost with all patients. That's possible with AI in, in the health sector. It's a revolution. Go for it. are other sectors. We have a digital health fund. Okay. For exactly that reason, that is um, focusing on underdeveloped or undeveloped countries. Um, that starts in the Middle East, where you have a lot of money but a bad healthcare system, <coughs> a lot of digital fluency, everyone has a phone, and you know goes into India and the, the other brick regions. For exactly that reason, you know you have a scarcity of good doctors, and um, the AI part of it can really help um, with a lot of the health issues and really drive forward um, and women's health and. And, you know, we have a, in the Middle East a lot of problems um, for obvious reasons and access to doctors is scarce and so AI is a phenomenal solution for that that will transform these, um, these countries, fully transform them. And AI is also working as a message service, so you don't need a smartphone to use it. That's right, okay. So uh, everybody has a doctor in the pocket now. Um, <laughs> other areas we think like AI will be the next generation because we, saw, we just heard, like, you know, it will be the investment vehicle for technology, but also non technology sectors. Do mm -hmm. you have any ideas what that would mean for us? I would, I would say I think technology assisted is going to be a big part of what we think about in finance. I mean, we'll think about automated cars. We were talking about that earlier. I mean, it's going to take a little bit for people to trust turning over that function 100%. We can all get on a monorail at Disneyland and know it's on a fixed track, but when you have to interface, with other people that are human that aren't automated, it's a little bit problematic. But what about 
auto assist to help you back up into that, you know, that uh, three point, that sort of that parallel parking. That's helpful. It's going to take a little bit to get maybe a little bit of trust built up. I have medical services, of course. What doctor? My father's a doctor, and for him to think about maybe someday he might. I'm not poo-pooing and saying he would never do it, but I think it's going to take time for people to get comfortable with making decisions about their own lives, whether it's finances or their health, trusting it totally to a digital sort of platform. And the same thing has happened in the finance world. We've got a robo advice that's going on. It's a very common, uh, common use for, I don't know if I call it AI, but it's digital or, or it's assisted by technology. And betterments of the world, wealth front, um, I think are very valuable services. Uh, I think, however, at, at our firm, when we think about somebody who's taking potentially their life savings and making better decisions, making sure it lasts for them, uh, people tend to want to look at you in the eye uh, to make sure there's a tangible person here who's taking care of me and my family and my future. Um, nothing wrong, like I said, with, with having digital assistance on, on doing things like tax loss harvesting within your portfolio make better decisions and, and reading trends in the marketplace. But I know at the end of the day, a lot of the people that we work with are getting warming up to the idea of having uh, artificial intelligence uh, make better decisions, but they're not quite to the point where they're ready to turn that over to a uh, fully automated service. And I often tell people these types of services are valuable, uh, investment advice that is truly automated based on answering a few questions. But remember, these services were born in a bull market and uh, will be tested when we do have some volatility pick up again. Again, not to poo-poo it, but we will see you know, how those, and what will often happen, and I think will happen in this case, when we do have a down market, it'll be a learning phase, whether it's for, for financial services firm, it's an opportunity for the learn to get better. So as a firm at Boston Private, we believe technology-assisted decision-making is gonna be a big part of our future. We're just not quite ready to turn it over to a computer just yet. I'm just going to like give a little perspective around sort of how like it's great that seven years have gone into a product like that, but what has happened in the last two years is is breathtaking from the components that you can plug together to actually make use of AI. So the tools that we've actually got as developers and as product people to plug together and, and solve for things are are quite breathtaking, and a lot of these things are being componentized as we speak and made available, even to the point where. Um, I mean, it, AI always is a big word, so it's been around for many, many years, and it actually go, goes down to machine learning and automation at this point in time. And a lot of the data models actually live off of whether you have good data models or bad data models, so garbage in, garbage out always applies. But what's happened now is that you're, you're seeing work being done on one model learning from another model, and you have the ability to patch together different models. So in the end, you know, Google, for example, can actually open up the Vision sure. AI uh, where you can actually classify your photos. It's been actually trained on zillions of different photos that actually were in the Google database. And you as a developer don't have to take care of that any longer. You can actually de build derivative products off of that. So I think we're just um, scratching the surface of actually how that's gonna impact us personally. But more exciting is actually from a business process point of view. I would fully agree, not just an investment landscape, but any anything that has to do with you know, discovery, um, you know, anomaly detection, um, you know, an insurance company can actually benefit highly from actually having an automated, much more flawless uh, profile of actually what is a claim that is worthwhile and what isn't. Um, I think we're we're going to see a huge amount of um, productivity step up for the companies themselves and the processes themselves as a result of it. As much as it's going to touch us personally, all these things are going to be pretty much invisible for the consumer. Very good point. Um, I read the Gartner again, and it says like they predict uh, it will generate 2.9 trillion in dollars in business value, which is a nice sum, but also recover 6.2 billion hours of worker productivity. So my question to you is more like a bit critical. Does it change our system, our living together to the very end? Are we facing an industry 5.0 revolution here because of AI? And how do you answer the question with respect to I'm losing my job? I personally think it's a real question that, you know, I mean, much of the frustration in the Midwest and in the United States has been not getting a perspective and not, you know, and, and it's, it's our fault in Silicon Valley that we didn't find an answer to those questions in timely fashion so that the fear could build up. Um, I personally think that uh, we do have to talk about, you know, minimum income. We have to talk about how to give people purpose and it's not necessarily going to be the job. It's going to be something else. And, you know, 
not going to go to how many Hesse Glass Counts view, but <laughs> but it's going to be it's going to be something of that shape and form where we have to really rethink how society works and what a, what purpose of the human being is. Um, that number is real. It's going to be real pretty soon. It's going to happen faster than people think it will. Um, but it's not just enough to shoot out a self-driving truck, which, you know, in 51, 50 states of the United States, I think the truck driver is the job number one in the state, you know, it's going to do a lot of, you know, collateral damage that we have to be aware of. And so, um, I don't have the answers to that. I, I'm around a lot of people that think about that all the time, but, you know, I don't think that they have the, the, the real conclusion on it yet. So I just saw a... Uh uh, two months ago, an article and then he was saying like uh, because the truck driver is the biggest workforce community in the U.S. and they are representing 380,000 people in this country, and AI made them make them lose their jobs. So I think we have to we have to answer that, right? Particularly the political decision that we have here. Yeah. By the way, if any questions come, up, please just answer right away. Uh, we have a little time on the very on the end of this uh, discussions for questions, but if you have specific questions on the topics, just uh, let us know. There's all we run. Yes, okay. so I have a question just generally for the panel uh, on the point of the idea of jobs. Um, there was a investment firm in Scotland that did a big survey a few weeks ago and. Um, Apparently, they said that up to 800 million jobs may actually disappear by, I think it's uh, 2025 or something like that. And they did a prediction for the US as being about a third of the workforce. So, if that's true, I'm not saying it is, but if it is, I would imagine the whole way that we do business and the economy is going to change significantly. So what, how do you feel, what is your perspective of how you think we might be living in this kind of new age of AI? <laughs> <laughs> Silence. <laughs> no, I think it's a, it's, it's a valid question that um, constantly technology is transforming the way we work. And I would tackle it from a perspective of, a, you know, what are the tools we used 20 years ago? Um, or 30 years ago when the personal PC, you know, computer came up and everyone thought, oh, it's going to like take my job away, we won't have accountants anymore, we're just going to have um, computers. And then Excel started and now and from that time on there were more accountants than ever because suddenly everyone could actually do their own finances and everyone had access to things. So I think um, on one hand there are going to be jobs that are disappearing, on the other hand it's this phenomenal new age that we don't know what new jobs we're going to create. I think factors that we're going to be working much more flexible, which is anyways true because we get also older and older and older, right? So with modern healthcare systems, you might actually live to 125, 130, 150 years. So does it mean school suddenly lasts 40 years? You know, does it mean I work until 120 years old? Like, what do we do with that time, right? So I think it's going to be also more flexible work and you know, more peace picking. People who have a lot of experience with AI systems and how to apply these tools are going to become extremely valuable. Mm -hmm. So just throwing AI at things doesn't solve it, right? It's like saying, you know, we have a problem with finance, I'm just going to throw a computer program at it. <coughs> that alone will not solve it. You need to like, train the model as well. You need um, experience in that as well. And I think there's a whole new generation of jobs that's going to emerge from that. And actually, in the self-driving car, I read that uh, they are thinking to have uh, humans, like mechanical Turks, in a mm -hmm. backup. So mm -hmm. if, where if, you, if your self-driving fails, you can push a button and then a remote so driver a overtakes. For you. Yes. Yeah. yes. So this will also be a huge new yeah. job. <laughs> We, sh yeah, we shouldn't spend too much time on this political stuff because you want to find yourself in no <laughs> Other questions about malpractice when AI is practicing medicine? <laughs> Question, is this practicing medicine or is it just giving advice? Is AI just giving advice? <coughs> just advice at the moment. Uh, okay. But it's possible to combine it with sensors. You can do much more with it in the future. I think the interesting part here is, again, coming back to self-driving cars, is if the cars are truly self-driving, how will that change crash tests? Because in theory, there will be no crash, right? So are we going to have an institute that is going to like 
compare different machine learning driving tests and say, oh, this model is safer than this other model. Maybe it doesn't matter anymore if you have an airbag or 20 airbags or what kind of an Audi cell you have around it. Maybe it's more important to understand, okay, what software is driving it? Which version is it? What's the databases of that? And so a digital crash test, so to speak, to have different versions of it. And the same is true for your medical malpractice, right? How good is the model? Maybe, um, you know, certain medications that like 40 years, Kondagan and stuff like that, you know, was administered and now turns out to be a terrible idea. May we have the same situation with medical advice, you know? So I think we have to really embrace the digital transformation. And then, by the way, there, just, just from a legal perspective, there are tons of thoughts around it, who's liable for what and when and where. It's always when the lawyers have a new idea, they talk about it, and we will have an, we will have an answer on that, definitely, yes. But I, I agree with lawyers you. Lawyers and trash for it, too. No, just if you ask us. Um, I assure you, I mean, there was always a technical development which wasn't suitable for what we learned in the past, so we have to cope with it anyway. And I think from the legal perspective, it's my idea, we cannot stop that stuff anyway. Even though there will be a responsibility of whoever there, there will be an answer. Otherwise, you know, no, law never stops technology. But we come to this, when we talk about Bitcoin a lot, I think on regulatory stuff. <laughs> I just want to change topic a little bit to, to Let me the... Let just add yeah, one more thing. So, so I work with uh, Singularity University down in Muppet Field. Um, and there's this uh, global, um, global solutions program that at the end we do a core case of the future. And so we go through different cases just to educate everyone in the room of, of like how to put yourself into a perspective that today doesn't exist, but may in future actually do exist very well. I mean, obviously, things like like that that were touched on are part of that. Like, what's the ethical right way to actually decide whether the two people that you're heading with the car towards are the right ones to run over, <laughs> or the the elderly on the sidewalk? <laughs> or the other other car on the other side of the street that basically is coming the other direction with three people against you know in it. It's there there's there's no right or wrong in it. You just have to start to think about giving a framework and actually making ethical decisions and putting ultimately putting that in code that is actually limiting or empowering the AI. And it goes, you know, even further than that. It's like, you know, okay, when you have a robot and it actually develops AI and at some point in time, the producer of that robot says, I want to do an upgrade of the firmware that actually takes away some of your consciousness. And the, and the robot goes to the court and says, I don't want that. Because <laughs> <laughs> it sounds so far-fetched. It's not that far-fetched. We're not that far from thinking these things over and redefining the way that we look at these things. I, I would like to add uh, one, one word about uh, the automatization fears. Um, in the past industrial revolutions, 50 years ago, so it was all the time the same discussion. And uh, it never went through the, uh, uh, many people um, uh, lose their job. But the real problem behind that is the overpopulation. And that is a thing, uh, the whole world has big problems. And it's a different kind of uh, discussion, of course. <laughs> There's all sorts of fear that we can talk about. I, I think it sometimes is under emphasizing the goodness that is going to come from all this. So, you know, it's a very German behavior to think about the risks more than you <laughs> Whereas the question did not come from German, actually. So I didn't ask it, it was me. <laughs> Anyway, it makes yes. it so difficult for me to, to go to the next topic, but I want to talk just a little bit because you were talking about, like, you know, you've been driven the car from somewhere else. This brings me to VR, AR. Uh, um, this I read in the, in the in this business wire. Worldwide spending on augmented reality and virtual reality is forecasted to reach 17.8 billion in 2018, an increase of nearly 95% over the 9.1 billion uh, for this year. Did you invest in AR, VR this year? Any examples? So we, where should we bring my channel in to next next month? I get so, my uncle. <laughs> How many people have have you know had an Oculus on their head at one, at one point in time? Okay, so maybe one third. I personally found it the most impactful technology experience that I've experienced in a long time. And I'm not a big believer in in, in VR, which is the full immersion, but more the AR, the augmented reality version of it. But just the, the amount of like human assistance and impact it can have and experience, it's amazing. 
It's completely amazing. I put my 85-year-old father-in-law into one of those things and said, and it didn't explain him much. And he was going up and down the roller coaster and everything. And I, I filmed it. And actually, at the end of the film, he's like, "Why didn't I feel anything?" He was expecting to feel something, which is which is amazing because he's never been around these things. He's never actually experienced them, and he was already in it within two seconds. And so. Um, the, the use cases are still sparse, and it's going to be a long way to go, but you know, there, there will be use cases that actually help people in many different ways, not just for entertainment purposes, but for you know, stress management and you know, um, other medical reasons, and you know, not just teleportation, but you know, really, really <laughs> use cases that help the human being. And, and so, yeah, I, I, was, I invested in, in a company that um, tra trains um, humans to learn an instrument without actually ever seeing a note. So basically feeling through an AR, feeling whether a note is right or wrong by the colors they see. And so blindly playing guitar, and it was, I just, I just thought it was cool. It was nothing, I, I didn't have a use case and I didn't have a, um, I didn't have a business case associated with it, but I thought it was like amazing. Wow. I had this class on, and did the roller coaster thing I had to take off, it was too scary for me, because as you said, it was a real reality feeling kind yeah. of thing. Any other ideas on um, VR? You guys have some experience on that? Yeah, so I think uh, VR was, uh, Facebook was too early, Oculus was too early because the technology was not ready. Uh, the resolution of these kind of um, uh, things are, are uh, too bad. So it's more a vision of virtual reality, but not virtual reality. Facebook, as, as far as I know, uh, will next year come out with a, with a new type, a wireless, a smaller, lighter, and hopefully with um, uh, a 2 4K resolution, but I'm not sure if they're able to do it. It's a mass of data they have to send uh, from, from the base computer to it. And um, I see the same like you um, in the education sector because it's, it's, it's an additional dimension. Uh, you can, uh, in, in comparison with a book or a 2D a video, and um, the, the uh, coolest thing I have ever seen, and it's uh, uh, also a thing I think in the, in the future, uh, we will have it uh, as soon as the technology will be there, is the volumetric uh, film. Uh, it's uh, from Hofer and Fraunhofer Institute, they developed uh, a virtual film where you can walk in Mm -hmm. And you see uh, all the actors in real, mm -hmm. the, and, and you can walk around them and they are acting. Um, it's uh, in Berlin, Potsdamer Platz, in a, in a museum called Kinematik, uh, they, they can test it. And uh, I will help them to bring it to San Francisco, it will be more of it. Uh, it's 160K, uh, and they killed uh, a game engine. Um, and uh, now they ported it to, a, to, a, to another game engine with no run limit. And uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a big issue uh, to realize this technique. And we will come to it maybe in three years. Let me just run a little bit further. Uh, uh, Sarah, uh, you told me you're uh, passionate about uh, payment landscape and the transformation potential of blockchain technologies. Mm -hmm. And blockchain, I mean, uh, there is no way around blockchain. Uh, and interesting enough, what I have here, somewhere here, it was just horrible for me to see. This is the German uh, uh, um, yellow press for lawyers, and it said blockchain, the technology changes the legal market. I was shocked, honestly speaking. Why was I shocked, Sarah? What's, what's blockchain and what do you have to expect in 2018? Besides the financials, that's the best. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm by no means an expert on blockchain, but I think it can be, it will be highly significant and impactful in industries where there is a lot of complexity uh, in industries where there's a lack of transparency. Um, and I think like the two biggest use, use cases at this point are one, um, as a platform, so for markets, for settling, for you know making settlements and clearing, uh, and also as a, um, uh, kind of a, a, to enable that store of value for uh, the, the cryptocurrencies. So, uh, and also as a platform, I think why you were surprised is it enables this smart contracting uh, technology. So, uh, you know, where lawyers play a really big role is, you know, between party A and party B. 
And what the blockchain does is enable the interaction between two parties in a decentralized but trustful manner. Removing said lawyer. <laughs> Just to be clear on that. Okay, so we've seen more of some Philip, any other use case besides getting a high job on the, on the blockchain, specifically outside of the financial sector? Because I think it's something indeed you, you said about trust. I hear a lot about governmental use, identification use, and all this stuff. How do you feel about that? Is that already ready, coming next year, or what are you thinking about? No. No. <laughs> so, Let's move to the next topic then. <laughs> so, so the reason I'm spending 120% of my time in that field is that I, I personally think that that is the biggest revolution that we've experienced in, 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 in computing in the next, in that, since, since 20 years basically. So, um, and I'll explain it in two very easy ways like how, how that is the case. So I, I don't know, I'm not going to explain what a blockchain is, but the, the general sort of, you know, uh, the general benefit of it is the trustless network of being able to transact with people that I don't know. That you know, and it's a, it's an immutable um, record that allows people to have security in what it is. So that sounds abstract, but the power is that there's no middleman. And every institution that we know, not just financial sector today, is driven by middlemen. So if you look at you know Equifax a couple weeks ago being hacked. You know, 350 million records being sort of spread out in some hacker landscape, and you can purchase them on different marketplaces these days. You know, if I had a way to own that record of mine and not be able to sort of be hacked because it's a decentralized database in the end, that's a huge benefit. And I, mean, I always call it like the, the right technology at the right point in time because there's all these other use cases that actually exist in other parts of the technology landscape. Let's say DNA sequencing, for example, right? DNA sequencing was, I think it was like a $3 billion thing, you know, a couple years ago, then it went to $10,000, now it's actually $1,000. They're developing toilets where you can actually sort of, you know, do that every single time you go to the toilet. And that's going to be like a couple cents, right? If I, as a, as a consumer, as an individual, if I can actually have ownership of my own data, my own premise, then that's a very, very significant so we're trialing all this in a market that is obviously financially driven and it's in value storage like Sarah said. But there's a number of use cases that have a real material impact. So I've, I, I was on the phone with a company yesterday that does, is a public market uh, for commodities trading out of London. And they are, for example, they are, um, they're buying uh, gas in Africa of, and the target is in two years time, a billion dollars worth of gas that they turn into fertilizer. And they will distribute that through government programs to the individual farmer in Africa on mobile phones so that that farmer can go and fetch the fertilizer from the distribution center. Normally, all that money in the fertilizer gets lost in the Russian oligarch and, and, the, and the African dictator trying to cut it up another deal, right? So the, the application there, yes, it's financially driven at the end, but it's actually more about record keeping, making sure that it actually arrives at the point in time where it should be arrived in the use case. And there's all sorts of use cases around that. So record keeping is a big one. I don't believe in the identity use case that much because it takes a lot of adaption over time. And, and I know that the constituencies are not really interested to support that. So we come from the online advertising space. So we know exactly that people are not incentivized to do it that way. Um, but, okay, I happen to work on you know, securitization of, of, you know, of assets. And I think that's going to be another use case beyond the currency use case that is going to just drive the next probably a couple trillion dollars going through the space. I also think what one of the you know biggest utilities that you get out of the blockchain are just these massive network effects. So it enables per people to be participants in an economy where, or you know, some kind of transaction or system where they might not have previously been able to be a participant of. So in the United States, if you think about municipal bonds, you know, they're raised at you know, this local level, but what if they don't have to be raised by the local government or the local, and they can actually be raised by the local community? And each member of that community actually has a stake in saying, these are our priorities for what we want to actually spend money on for our community and somehow get the grant money or you know, crowdsource amongst the community and actually do something that is meaningful for them versus you know, grant money that's just kind 
dictated from top down. Are you about to say something? Yeah, I agree. Could Sarah please do a rewind and explain to the audience who might not know what blockchain is, like we're sixth graders, what you're talking about? <laughs> please do. <laughs> I think you can do that. Okay, so, so. So, no, can Sarah do it, please? Okay. <laughs> the expert. You're not letting her talk at all. <laughs> no, he's definitely the expert on no, blockchain. Would you please explain it to like we're six So when we say it's decentralized, you, just what is blockchain? Blockchain is the best way I can describe it is a decentralized database. So there is no central owner, and all of the data on the system exists by all of the participants in the system. So everyone in the system has access to all of the transactions that are happening. If you say in the system, is it the internet? Or do I have to sign up for a program or a platform? Or how? how? Well, I'm going <laughs> <laughs> to. Yeah, so, so think of it as a public ledger. I mean, imagine you. There's no accounting firm that you know records transactions like your bank, mm -hmm. but it's it's a public ledger, and everybody who participates in a transaction, whether it's certifying a contract to get rid of the lawyers and mm -hmm. help them, um, or it's it's something else. It's it's essentially everybody signs. But what's different about encryption? What happened before was a one-way relationship. I would encrypt it, send you the key, or you would have the key and could right. open it. Yeah. What we are doing now is I basically put my signature around this piece of data and the next person can look at it and say, yes, I can trace back the origin. It really came from that sensor. It really came from that doctor. Mm -hmm. It came from that person in Africa. And, and, but everybody can sort of trace back and, and see the origin. And it's all encryption in between. That's sort of the, the sixth grade explanation. Mm -hmm. So. So it's completely transparent, which is the controversial part here. Because a lot of people basically say, we don't want transparency. We actually like the fact that we can hold an invoice and not pay it and say we never received it. <laughs> so with, with, with this, we have like complete transparency as to who modified what, why they modified it, when they modified it. So, so and, and it's public knowledge on the internet. Mm -hmm. So can I, can I just, just, just to one point that you mentioned, because I think this is an important point there. So, uh, absolutely right. So what is, a tr what is a bank account? A bank account is a server that has numbers saying that your bank account has $100 in it, right? So if there's some centralized authority that sits there with that record and says, you know, when you go to the ATM that you have $100. Mm -hmm. The revolutionary thing here is a combination of a different couple of things. One is actually distributed ledger, meaning that everyone who's a participant in the network has a copy of the entire ledger. Which means that if, if we all in the room have a ledger that we transact on, and I have the entire ledger, I can hold anyone else accountable to the fact that he has $100 and he's just transferred $50 to someone else. Right? So it's a, it's, it's a way for everyone to keep honesty without a central authority in the middle saying that it has to be this way. And it's absolutely safe and no one can yeah, actually... So the second innovation <laughs> is actually cryptography, which means that you are the only one that can modify what is done with your record. Meaning you hold the only key that actually can en enable you to unlock or transfer or do anything with that record. So no one else can do that. By the way, it comes with a lot of responsibility, which you know a lot of people have painfully experienced, because if you lose that key, right. So I, it's, I guess, it's in limbo. I <laughs> guess banks are against it as much as lawyers are, right? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, don't want to crash the party, but it's not quite that simple. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted an easy first, explanation. First, first so. of all, the problem with security, the block, it's called blockchain because you basically trust the chain that is the longest. Basically, every, every block that you add to that public ledger has an, a special code from the previous block and that creates this chain basically. Oh, which one was the previous block? Oh, this one. Let me look into this one. Oh, okay, and this at the very end has another line. Okay, I look into this one again and you trust the longest one. Now, the way this is done is you have to like have some stake in, yes. in the way this is computed and you can either have stake of work, that means you do some complicated computation and that's the work you put in, it's computing power and heat and, and energy. 
you can have a proof of stake, like a different kind of things, how you prove that you actually participate in their network. You ask, can I just join? What do I have to do, right? And there are intermediaries who also do that for you. So here we are in the middleman situation again, right? <laughs> I don't want, class, I that's what I'm saying. It's, like, it's, it's not that black and white, oh, it's like the brave new world, everyone can participate, right? There needs to be someone who does some sort of participation in that. And the reason that it is a little bit more complex than that is if you have more than 50% of the compute power, and that happened last year three times, then you can create the next block and say, oh, I think this is the next block, you just wired $15 to me, actually. And then, because I have the compute power, the biggest compute power in the world, I can say, and the majority of the blockchain validated that. And I happen to be the majority, by the way. Right? So this is a real dangerous thing. And there were several safe mechanisms and hot forks, you're going to read about that a lot. So many, many ways to screw this up. We're in the infancy, and we should really have our eyes wide open and understand that, because if you don't understand it, you're missing the next financial instrument, and you're missing the next financial platform altogether. And if we don't look into this and understand it, you're going to be sidelined very quickly in the next five years. Okay. I want to jump on this just after the next question, because exactly what you're saying, where we go, we have to be careful, yeah. and that in particular applies to cryptocurrency, and this is uh, uh, something you were waiting for. Um, <laughs> your statement, with the crypto market at 10 times plus and ICOs at 3 billion plus in 2017, I have not paid any attention to the regular financial markets. In 2018, after some corrections, there will be more of that dynamic and real money flowing into the crypto space. When I wrote this, when I saw Bloomberg in November, they said it was a 700% growth a race of the value of Bitcoins. We're now at, what is, where are we now? 1,600 or something? 16,500 today. Uh, that was 7,000 a couple of weeks ago. No, it was no. 7,000 two weeks ago. Sorry, no, two weeks ago. Three, three weeks ago. Three weeks ago. So where does that lead to? And then actually, is cryptocurrency indeed the next currency besides the regulatory aspects? We come to this a little later. Okay, so first of all, no investment advice, no legal advice, I'm not giving tax advice whatsoever, so please let's get that. There is no the legal advice, here we have the AI now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, first of all, I'm not here to defend the currency aspect of it. I think that the fascinating thing about sort of the application of blockchain into a currency aspect or called currency aspect, because actually no one really agrees that it's actually currency, um, is that. Um, there's a real need for people to, and it was intended to be a, a, a transactional system, and it turned out to be more a value storage system, like Sarah was mentioning. So people, um, you know, putting something in there, hoping that it's a counterparty currency that other people agree that there's some value, right? And it's gone through its ups and downs. I mean, we're, we're talking about 2008 until today. It's not an overnight success, right? Um, but the point is that when you really dissect actually who's in, who's engaged here, the the, the speculative um, element of Wall Street has, number one, not really arrived yet. There's, there's a, a bunch of activity, but it's not really there yet. And a lot of the undercurrents are happening through use cases that are not driven by, you know, by our Western thinking necessarily. So um, one of the key use cases is, for example, remittance payments. So a Philippine worker from the United States transferring money back to the family in the Philippines, it's too costly to do it with Western Union. So he does it by, you know, by buying Bitcoin here and sending Bitcoin back to the family. And it happens to be that the family then suddenly learns about Bitcoin and suddenly Bitcoin is the thing that is like in, within 10 people in that family. So that, that's one thing. Aside, and let's be honest, also the early innings, of it was obviously the gray, if not black markets, right? I mean, we all knew what Silk Road was and et cetera. But that's, that's actually long gone. I mean, there's a real, real desire by people living in high inflation countries to rather store their money in a counterparty risky currency called Bitcoin, rather than keep it in their local currency or in real estate in their local, local economy. And that is driving a lot of the underground swell that happened in the last 24 months that actually made people escape risk. Brexit was a huge driver of crypto adoption. <coughs> Trump was a huge driver of crypto adoption. And let's not forget that it's, it's kind of silly. I mean, I was, I was at an investor conference a couple weeks ago, and there was you know, a lot of critical comments in the, sort of in, the, in the realm of limited partners in that room. And I said, well, 
You know, and one of the guys said, well, um, isn't it astounding that you have to go through all this ordeal to participate in that? And it's not really being used, you know, I can, I can buy a pizza, but that's, you know, one off use case. But, um, and I said, well, yeah, but listen, it's because the distrust about people that we represent in this room is so big. Meaning that a lot of people go through that ordeal because they don't trust the central authorities. And that's a phenomenon that I think we're seeing at the outer fringes in many the political aspects and economic aspects. That is a phenomenon that is going to continue down the road. So the currency aspect is an important one, but it's, it's, it's by far not going to be the biggest use case. Those, those things are going to be surpassed by other, other value, value trading aspects of it. Um, but honestly speaking, uh, hearing like from 7,000 to 17,000 in two weeks, uh, I have a quote from JP Morgan Chase uh, CIO Jamie Diamond. Bitcoin is a fraud, a bubble that can burst any moment. And you know what he did two days later? They traded. Yeah. <laughs> is it a bubble? I mean, 700, 7,000 to 17,000 okay, so in two weeks? I personally, again, no advice here. I personally think, yes, we are right now in a bubble phase. But you know, I'll, I'll make an analogy. So if, if you really hold the value storage uh, um, aspect true to its value, so it's more like gold. So gold is also counterparty. Yes, it has interesting physical aspects around it, but it's you know it's kind of heavy and it's like you know clunky and you know beautiful, but you know it doesn't <laughs> give me any any value that I can eat or do something. With, right? And so in a way, you know this is no no different. The benefit of Bitcoin is that you can move it around and nobody can literally take it away from you, right? And there's only going to be 21 million Bitcoin ever created. That's algorithmically set in stone, meaning that. There's $300 million worth of gold being added to the ecosystem a day. So if I, if I take the market capitalization of gold and I divide it by 21 million uh, as, a, as a base, I end up at $470,000 per Bitcoin, theoretical value. Right? So if that's the only use case that Bitcoin has, there is, there, it's, I'm not claiming that it's going to go there, but it's not unrealistic to assume that we're going to have a much higher level with more interest coming in, and that's not just that's not just vaporware. That's real demand for it. Yeah. I like to refrain from using the word bubble because I think it implies something that's about to pop, and I don't think we know where we are on the scale. Like, could this thing, could this market continue to climb and really exceed any sort of like rational expectations? I definitely think that there's a path where that happens. I also think there's a path where there is a significant decline in price, and uh, the market becomes significantly more volatile. But I just don't think that we know, you know, until we have the hindsight to know. That being said, I think the space the space is very frothy, if you will, um, which is evident by a lot of the ICOs that happened over the course of the last 12 months. You see these really enormous valuations for projects that have very little utility and. Uh, frankly, don't even really need a token uh, to begin operating. Um, but at the same time, like the level of investment and attention is bringing some really creative entrepreneurs and innovations to the space. So, uh, I guess we'll I think see. Not the, 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 I think there is this like bifurcation right now. Whenever we talk about a bubble, we say there is a class of investors who, without thinking, invest. Right. So, 99, 2000, where people. Wire money and don't even know what the equity is going to be like. Peter Thiel was telling the story, right? Where suddenly money arrived and you didn't even know what for, right? So where people like mindlessly invest. But I think this is a bifurcation of the market. There are people like ICOs, where people just say, "What's the downside?" Listen, I invest like a thousand dollars of my equity, right? It's like, like, and I get like something that's worth zero point zero 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 one cent to begin with, right? But the upside is huge. So. Worst thing that can happen is I lose a thousand dollars, right? So what's it? You know, so this is the investor mindset of people who actually very rationally think about this. They say, I treat Bitcoin as an asset class, and I have a diversification strategy. So I put some in private equity, some in bonds, some in some other stuff, some in venture capital, and some in Bitcoin, of course, right? Because what's the downside? I lose a little bit, right? And so, and the, I think the the ICO part of that. Um, really shows that there are a lot of people who, who think exactly the same way because it is a democracy, everyone can participate. You have a huge amount of money because you don't have to go to your broker. You don't pay 1595 brokerage fee or whatever it is, right? And so it's like, it's an easy way to do. Now, is it justified? Um, 
the risk of startups, just because we have ICOs, has not changed. The risk of survival has not changed. Yeah, just jump in here. Uh, I think it's important that we define what we're talking about. So a, the time of B, ICOs. And one thing, I read Aragon, they raised 25 million in 15 minutes on ICO. Yeah. What is an ICO for those of you who might not know what is an ICO? Somebody explain that. It, ICO, initial coin offering, it uses basically these smart contracts that we defined before. A company says, I'm going to offer this great coin and it's going to cost a certain amount that they're going to offer it for and you can buy it from me with cash. And that's what it is. And then everyone says, okay, I'm going to buy it. I don't know what the market is. I don't know how to sell it. I don't know what equity share I actually own of that company that says I'm going to offer that. I don't know what the voting right is. I don't know how I'm going to get my money back ever because there needs to be a market. Someone needs to say I'm going to buy it for a certain amount, right? At the end. So an ICO basically is a company that uses the blockchain to create a smart contract and say, you know, I'm going to collect some money now, and if you believe it's going to be worth more, then good luck with that. That's the, okay. that's the VC talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. With, with no liquidation preferences. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we're really trying, no, no, but realistically, we're really, as VCs, trying to wrap our head around how do we participate in ICOs. And Fred Wilson wrote a great blog about it in Northern Rick. Yeah. It has a lot of complexity around it where we just don't know yet how this is going to do. Yeah. I think yeah. I, a little different not perspectives. Too not, not, not too long, yes. I, we work in a business very actively with currencies and precious metals. And uh, I was awarded a patent several years ago of building an interface between the institutional and retail world in the precious metal space. And I think one way, and it's a very different way than you think about cryptocurrencies, is that you mentioned earlier, oh, cryptocurrencies are very useful for Western Union transactions, for countries where there are very high inflations. And the, the key thing there is that the, the public infrastructure is dysfunctional. Transaction costs are too high or you don't trust your government. Mm -hmm. Well, in the developed world, for the most part, not only do public institutions function, but there's also the power of the government. And one of the things that developed countries are very concerned about is that um, they control anything mm -hmm. that's successful. They control, um, in, they used to be bearer shares in Europe, um, they got rid of those because they don't know who owns them, they want to be making sure that you pay your taxes. And so one of the reasons why quote unquote mainstream hasn't embraced cryptocurrencies is because they haven't wrapped their head around, well how, and I'm, by all means blockchain is capable of doing it, but where we are right now there's a lot of mistrust that people who buy them are going to pay the taxes and whatnot. Sure. Yeah. And so right. those are the sort of growing pains that that technology has, and those are the sort of things that, that in order to get the big banks be involved rather than just making comments to actually engage in those sort of things. You've got to build these interfaces so that actually this thing that you know who everybody is, also the banks, a big bank doesn't want, to, doesn't want to know you. If you go to Bank of New York, they don't want to know you, but they want to know that if they transact with you, that whoever transacts on your behalf <coughs> is credible. And so those are the sort of interfaces that, that need to work for the developed world. And, because that doesn't work yet, that's why it's shunned by the big institutions. And that's why it's kind of the computer geeks that do it, and the venture capitalists, and the folks who, who do Western Union. Actually, that's, that's, just, uh, just, uh, just one, one addition. Uh, it's, it's very important. Uh, exactly that was the next question. Now, you're saying like you don't like the regulators, and they will not. I like them. <laughs> you like them, but they will not suppress the Bitcoins. Uh, uh, that's what you said. No. No? OK. No, I said it was <laughs> my lawyer. I said it was. <laughs> <laughs> I said something way different. Okay. <laughs> the, the question I have is indeed what you're saying, as you said, like, you know, you just go out, have a product, and you get the money for it, and nobody's under control. I just read that the SEC has a new uh, entity now created, Cyber Union, in September 2017, exactly to focus on misconduct involving ICOs and blockchain. Mm -hmm. And William Hennon, the chief uh, of SEC, said, I, will, uh, I think you will see more of our guidance through enforcement actions. Uh, we expect yeah, to bring. Expect to bring. So, so there's a regulatory aspect here too. How you come over? So, but really, what regulatory aspect? The regulation just says, was there any misconduct? Now, if I put out an ICO and I write into it, it's a high risk investment. It might fail. You might lose all your money. And who knows if my product is going to work? Just like any startup does the same thing. 
there's nothing illegal about it. You got fully informed about it. You got read all the disclaimers, <laughs> right? And you lost everything, right? And so I think, or you might have won everything. Who knows, right? I'm not no, so, 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 the, so the, yeah. the regulatory side of it is that um, there are very, very stringent securities laws in the United States specifically. So especially when it comes to the transfer of you know, a security of one, from one person or entity to another, there's a lot of qualifications that you have to go through in order to make that legal. Yeah. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not judging whether it's good or bad. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm practically compliant in many different ways. But, but, um, <laughs> but my, point, my point about that is that it is, I mean, as much as legislation has been clear in the past, actually these new use cases are really hard to put into that context. And so, you know, the ICOs, they try to claim mostly that they're a utility and not a security. And they, they try to take the so-called Howey test um, as an example, which is defining what a security is, and try to bend the rules such that their token is being used in many different aspects and try to evade the, the, the declaration of a security because that has a big ramification on what they have to do before they can sell it, what they have to do to ensure that only someone who's permitted to receive it actually gets it on the other end. So the SEC, however, has been awfully quiet around the, that specific topic. What they have been pursuing, there was uh, three rulings up to date, was obvious fraud. There was uh, two, one diamond company, one gold company that were claiming they have asset-backed uh, things and they didn't exist. And then there was another one called the Dow, which is a different story of its own kind, but that was basically clearly a security that was meant to be sort of, you know, giving people you know, participation is something that they should have had. Yeah. And so I think um, the bigger question around regulation, and, and you know, we're not going to get into the weeds of it, is that regulators are really slow. In the United States, I think the, the biggest push of any of the crypto crowd was because we knew the regulators would never act as fast as this market was evolving. Let's be honest, it's a regulatory arbitrage that we're doing, right? The second thing is that it's not just the SEC, it's the tax authorities in the same fashion. So there have been, in 50 states, there have been uh, 19 rulings of what actually cryptocurrency, or Bitcoin specifically, is. <coughs> Every single one was different. <laughs> and so last year, there were only 845 people that had cryptocurrencies listed on their tax um, report. Oh. Really? <laughs> 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 is sending me my. Well, <laughs> that's another fun one. Yeah. <laughs> the tax authorities are now sort of a rule that they want to get access to. Seventy yeah. million at this point in time. Seventy million users. users. That was the goal. Uh, okay. But okay. So they're only getting twenty million access. of which is in the United States. So yeah. that's going to be a fun ride. I think they're only getting yeah. access to something less than ten percent of our users. Yeah. So it's going to talk. Uh, ask me to ask the question. How do you text that stuff, right? <laughs> but we don't do it here now. <laughs> just, just one question. Um, you, you're talking. I mean, I think there's one big difference between an ICO and IPO. Actually, you have prospectus, and this is a checked thing, you know. And there are all lawyers involved. There, I know you don't like this. Them. The next, I mean, I don't, you can't compare an IPO with an ICO, yeah. though, right? That's so, like so the wrong. My, my question was to you and or to anybody. You saying like the ICO will not replace the IPO mm -hmm. in the future? Will we still see IPOs? I like think that's a wrong. It's a wrong question, right? Because okay. in the end, the IPO is an initial uh, public offering to a public uh, with all these prospectors that basically says we're going to offer this share. Now that could in the future totally happen on a blockchain. It's nothing talks against it. It's just a ledger, right? Whether that's on a stock market or in a blockchain, for me, it doesn't make a difference. It's the process, like we just said, behind it, having the prospectus that we can show having the few regulations around them and having the responsibility. I think, you know, a, block, a blockchain technology, let's phrase it as that, that maybe even Nasdaq is offering to participate in could totally support that. I would rather compare the ICOs with the traditional financing of a venture capital firm or high-risk capital. That's, I think, the better comparison that you would make right now. Okay. And I'm just going just to okay. say one small comment. We're coming back to what Sarah was alluding to, and um, let's, let's look at this is this is all stuff that needs to be figured out, and it needs to be regulated, and it needs to be sort of done in a shape and fashion that you know consumers are protected, and that you know tax authorities are comfortable with. The, the fascinating thing, however, about an ICO is it's it's making um, you know giving people the opportunity to participate in something and gain the value of growing that network. So to imagine that every user of Facebook 
that actually helped build that network of Facebook was a co-owner of that network. That is, that is the revolutionary part about it, that basically you can make that happen. You can form the decentralized Uber without Uber in the middle by having the Uber drivers come together and saying, ah, we don't want that middleman. We just want to have a more direct interaction with our customers, you know, all, but, all done decentrally, um, and still at the quality that we're, that we're used to actually receiving as an Uber consumer. It can absolutely be done decentralized. So, so I think- Can you take that to the next step when the car doesn't have drivers? Yeah. The cars can yeah. negotiate on the well, no, 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 like And they can negotiate for new tires and for maintenance. Yeah, yeah. So, so there's, there's a, a guy here. That, to, to me, that is the... Yeah. But the problem is we are, we don't have to drive. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, so, so there's this guy, Gil Pacina here, who's one of the mm -hmm. you know, uh, most prominent sort of angels on Angel, Angel List. And you know, he, he recently like, was saying at a party, he's like, I want my Tesla, while I'm not driving it, to mine Bitcoin to make money <laughs> that to then cool. have capital to buy other Teslas <laughs> to do the same thing <laughs> and with that money to either improve my driving sensation because it can bid against other cars to move off uh, aside from the road because my time is <laughs> valuable <laughs> right. or actually become its own entrepreneur in that sense and just you know run a fleet. So, but why would this Tesla keep all the money? Why, is why, why that? Why would his Tesla give him the, the core? Well, probably in the core of the future, they would probably say, I'm no longer owned by you. It's just uh, wonderful new ideas with uh, self-driving cars while negotiating my tires. Very good. Just, just one question, because we are running out of time here. But one thing I definitely want to ask, and this is besides that, uh, um, I, I read, and then you like that post, I think, uh, Michael Bloomberg stating, I thought Brexit was the stupidest, uh, stupidest thing a country has ever done, but then we trumped it. <laughs> <laughs> I think we cannot close this discussion with, uh, without talking about the, let's say, the relationship between the new administration on the other coastal side to Silicon Valley. And I just want to know, do you think that will have an impact on the developments in 2018, or is it just ignored by this area where we're in, in the future? That was a good one, right? <laughs> <laughs> every, every election has an impact on other countries, regardless of how, how it would have ended. You know, right now it's Trump, next time it's someone else. I think in the entrepreneurial world, in the innovation world, we're always going to find ways to survive, and you know sometimes scarcity makes very new innovative ideas. I think there is right now, of course, in the venture capital community, all this like taxation problem that we're talking about, um, the new regulations that are coming up. On the other hand, very large you know companies can bring money back into the U.S. I don't know if you've read about that, and you know get tax breaks for foreign taxes and stuff like that. That's going to make it incredibly hard for European companies to compete because Europe is not a country, it's a continent. It's highly fragmented. There are so many people out there. The reason that Brexit happened, from my perspective, you know, having a, a UK boss, you know, was really that um, there was really a frustration with everyone just pointing to Brussels. Mm -hmm. And that's what I hear mostly from my friends who live in London, who say everything Everything got to a standstill. People were just frustrated with people saying, oh, you know, we have to wait for Brussels to decide on this and this and this. You know, that shows the, the problem that Europe as a whole is in right now. And, you know, I'm very, I think we're very fortunate that Germany is a very strong country in the European Union, but um, it's very difficult with very large countries having such a purchase power and such a um, commodity power. Whereas Eric Schweitzer just said on Wednesday in the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung that the actual situation, the political situation in Germany will postpone the technical developments for years. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether this is so, I just read it, oh, yeah. Council General is just shaking his hand. I, 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 I did not consent, I just quoted it. <laughs> and, you know you were watching me. <laughs> what do you think from your perspective as being purely American? Well, I mean, I think, you know, it's amazing to me. We still here in a very high, highly regulated state, we've developed this, you know, Silicon Valley, and it's obviously spread beyond just what was, you know, the startup garage right. industry. And I think, when you think about Germany in particular, I know there's certainly a lot of, you know, there are hot spots in Berlin and uh, that, that are becoming much more 
uh, I would say, open to working in this new sort of environment. But I think you know, the German mentality not to, you know, to cast a wide net has often been, how do I improve what I have now? And how do I, I'm very rules oriented and regulatory environment. Silicon Valley is how do I break the rules, and that's how these we get these quantum leaps. And I think until we can get out of that mindset here, I mean, I know that's what Trump had mentioned. I'm going to break this. You know, I'm going to start opening up. There's too many regulations, and we're too many constraints on our business, uh, our businesses here in the United States. And he's trying to apparently work on that. But I would say, you know, as we, you know, a lot of the entrepreneurs that are coming uh, to develop these new technologies in Germany and elsewhere. I mean, over 50 percent, I believe, I was reading in. Uh, earlier today are coming you know, from other countries, whether it's from North Africa, whether it's from some of this, um, you know, the, the former uh, Russian type uh, states. I think you know, we're, we're seeing that mindset develop. And so I think breaking out of that and, and, and an environment where you have here in California so much regulation, I think is, is nothing but positive for countries that are kind of seeing those trends and, and you know, Germany being uh, you know, maybe one of those is going to allow for uh, a lot of competition here. I mean, I remember a few years ago at the airport in Las Vegas, a big sign, you know, bring your business to here, uh, to, to Nevada. We have much more, you know, taxation-friendly state. We don't have the, um, the, um, the workers' compensation problems here in California that we have, which are very systematic. So, um, you know, that is in the nutshell of, you know, what's going to develop out of what, what is a very entrepreneurial society, and not just outside of the United States, but I think to, to Germany in particular as well. It's not quite mentality-wise ready for that, but well, it's developing that, is at least my understanding. So again, that's what you need lawyers for. Anyway, um, <laughs> I would like to round up this fantastic round by each of you stating in one sentence what we will expect in 2018. Okay. Yeah. Sorry? One sentence. One sentence. That was it. You guys have one. One sentence. I think uh, um, uh, economic uh, growth will exceed to new highs. Productivity growth in the US will go up to very new highs. We'll double it maybe. Um, interest rates will rise sooner or later. Stock market will tumble. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> 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 a lot of commas, but it was one sentence. Economic forecast 2018, you're usually wrong. You know, maybe I should be writing a book and then hope that I type it on one of these rules. Um, I think we, for me, and I'm just going to speak for myself, uh, I think I'm going to meet a phenomenal new kind of people who take advantage of the digital transformation in Industry 4.0 um, that's happening right now with all the tools available as we heard before that you can plug together in machine learning and uh, I'm just so looking forward to this next year that's going to be again transforming the, the industry and disrupting itself almost I would say in this faster and faster cycle and I'm just looking really forward to meet these phenomenal entrepreneurs who are betting the house and you know, so make things happen. Yeah. <laughs> Sarah, can you make a longer one sentence? <laughs> I'll try. Um, I, I, I think we're at an interesting point where, you know, in the late 1980s, early 1990s, it was, you know, what is your internet strategy? Early 2000s, it's what's your mobile strategy? Um, and I think we're at a really interesting point where now it's like, what is your blockchain strategy? What is your AI strategy? So in 2018 and the years to come, I'm excited to see what kind of models and businesses and networks we can create that have not been thought of yet. Thank you. Uh, see, my investment advice, so, <laughs> diversify, know what you own, have a plan when things get a little bit dicey. Uh, we all know don't keep all your eggs in one basket, but I'd like to make sure you all know where your chickens are on the same farm. So if you know what you own, you'll be okay. You'll we'll make it through. Right. Chickens on the same farm. I think we're going to face some crazy, mind-bending uh, challenges of how we think of society. And uh, the reason I like that quote was basically that in a, you know, not just interconnected, but even borderless worlds, to build walls is the stupidest thing I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, the reality is that we're going to see borderless applications of the technologies, but specifically through blockchain, that actually make make sort of the, the regulation and sort of the nation states less relevant. That's a reality. So, I'll give you an example, and this is 
can't borrow the sense so <laughs> 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 um, beginning of September, China forbid ICOs. And it was probably the biggest contributor to the ICO craze before that. And suddenly it was a stop button. Number one, people were going to, to Starbucks and trading that like physically, which was like old school, right? But the other thing was that, um, and this is a quote from Vitalik Buterin who invented Ethereum, he said, the only effect of the ban is going to be that there are going to be more blockchain projects outside of China than inside of China. Mm -hmm. And we see this with small nation states like Estonia, who have a phenomenal e-governance that is happening. We see this with Switzerland, where a specific canton looks positively at it, and suddenly uh, Zug develops into the Silicon Valley for blockchain. Mm -hmm. That's the reality of today. Everyone's movable. Mobility is a real fact, and I think we have to really shift our gears in our head to think what that means. Thank you. I think the borderless uh, thing touched me the most today, mm -hmm. and then of course with a lot of regions around there, and borderless would be great. We're here in the German American Business Association tonight.